Hi, I'm Travis English with Kaiser. This is a presentation I'm going to give at the Ashray Southern California chapter on October 3rd of 2023. So healthcare ventilation is in a little bit of an odd spot uh, within Ashray and within HVAC engineering because we're different, right? We, we like to use air changes per hour. Everybody else talks about indoor air quality with standard 62 or based on contaminant sources. Um, we have these really specific temperature ranges like our exam rooms need to be between 70 and 75. Everybody else talks about comfort using standard 55 and uh, references all that research. Um, we have a lot of pressure requirements uh, into and out of spaces, trash rooms with negative pressure or departments with positive pressure. Nobody else really goes in for that. Uh, and of course, in healthcare, we have these very high ventilation rates with kind of massive energy consequences. Um, that we actively ignore. There's nowhere else in ASHRAE where you're kind of allowed to ignore the energy consequence of your work. <laughs> so healthcare is just different. Uh, and what I've found, I think, is that we're not different because the engineering problems are different. I mean, air quality and air cleaning and comfort and energy are still air quality and air cleaning and comfort and energy, um, whether you're in a school or a church or a, or a hospital. Um, we're different because of our history. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that history in this presentation. Uh, and then I'll talk about the present state uh, where we currently sit with healthcare ventilation is that within ASHRAE and within U.S. Uh, engineering, um, we are different. We like to be different. We like our air changes per hour. Uh, we like our specific temperature ranges. Uh, we like not giving a crap about energy. And we, we don't want to be like everybody else. And so then I'll talk about the future. Um, I think we're getting close to a tipping point. And by close, I don't mean that we're going to make a change in the next year or even in the next five years. But I do think that kind of before I die in, in the next era here uh, or the future, we'll look back at, at this era and, and look at it as the time where change began. And I think there's two big reasons for that. First off, the gap is really growing as ASHRAE moves more towards building energy performance and decarbonization and validation of indoor air quality and validation and things like that, um, healthcare ventilation really stands out sort of more and more every year as the one trade that's on this antiquated legacy paradigm. And then the second big reason is this infectious aerosols. So before we had a pandemic, there was this idea that infectious aerosols was a topic that only has to be thought about in healthcare ventilation. Healthcare people need to worry about it, nobody else does. Uh, and that's no longer the case. In the post-pandemic period, everybody is thinking about infectious aerosols and ASHRAE has a new paradigm for thinking about it, infectious aerosols. And I'm gonna talk about that inside this presentation. Because now after 2020, offices and schools and restaurants and, and churches they're also thinking about infectious aerosols. So let's jump into it. Uh, first off, I always have to start with energy because that's how I got into this whole healthcare ventilation thing. Here's two images to help us put US hospital energy into perspective. Uh, the one on the left is domestic energy used by building types. So hospitals are that big line <laughs> down a second from the bottom. Uh, those bars are in energy intensity, KBTU per square foot per year. And then the other image, the image on the right, uh, is international hospital energy use, and that's by country. So the U.S. and Canada are those top two bars, the really big bars. So essentially, U.S. hospitals use more energy per square foot. We use more energy than most commercial buildings by a factor of two or three. Uh, and uh, U.S. hospitals use more energy uh, than our European counterparts by a factor of two or three or sometimes even four. So our U.S. hospital energy signatures are quite high. Uh, the second thing to understand is how we use energy in um, hospitals. I wish I could say that hospitals use a lot of energy for medical equipment or clinical activities, but that's just not true. In fact, nothing could be further from the truth. Two thirds to three quarters of a hospital's energy signature is, is ventilation and heating and cooling. That's really where our energy goes. Uh, and then finally, the other thing to understand about how hospitals, about hospitals energy signature is that it's largely independent of weather. 
Um, so what we can actually do is we can separate out the what we call the base energy use from the weather dependent component of the energy use for both natural gas and for electricity. And, and that's the, so the base energy use is that blue square that you see there. And then the, the weather dependent energy use is sort of the orange um, chatter that's up at the top. And, and most of the energy use, uh, in this case, 83% of the natural gas, 95% uh, of the electrical and overall 90% of the energy use is non weather related. Uh, and we see that in the national numbers, um, hospital energy use is kind of very similar, whether it's in Seattle or San Diego or New York or Miami, we have that heavy uh, base uh, energy use that goes on. There's no mystery as to why this happens. We know exactly why this happens, and that is uh, because we ventilate our hospitals uh, because with this legacy methodology called air changes per hour. So we have these very high uh, ventilation rates. Um, if you're in California, you know this table as table 4A of the mechanical code published by HCI or the agency formerly known as OSHPOD. Um, but it, it nationally, this is a national standard and it's published by ASHRAE and it's called ASHRAE standard 170. Uh, the rest of this presentation, I'm gonna refer to it as ASHRAE standard 170. So then the question comes up, okay, where do these air change rates come from? You know, what are they based on and, and why are we using them? Okay, let's get into that. So in the 1850s, Florence Nightingale visited the military hospitals of the Cremarian War and she found they were dirty and dangerous places. She famously pointed out that for British soldiers, your chances of dying were higher in the hospital than they were on the battlefield. And so she called for reforms. Nightingale is the mother of modern nursing and she put in place major reforms in patient crowding and sanitation, and that included ventilation. So in her book, she talks about the smell of the wards and um, what urges to have enough ventilation to keep the, the air smelling sweet. Um, so in addition to her impact on nursing, Nightingale actually had a pretty big impact on architecture. So these are some of the designs that you would see uh, both sides of the turn of the century. So from about 1870 um, up till about 1920 in both Europe and the United States, you'd see this type of design. Uh, the, the patient wards were laid out in these sort of spines and each one of them had access to natural ventilation um, on both sides. Um, you will notice, by the way, that there's no uh, bathrooms in these floor plans and that's not a mistake. Uh, they didn't have bathrooms because it wasn't plumbed. And so um, if you want to empathize with Nightingale about the smell of the wards, you can kind of imagine these wards where there's patients in there with all sorts of different types of symptoms, no walls in between any of them. And they're using bedpans twice a day that get emptied twice a day, right? And then, and if there was an unventilated space, um, the smell would be pretty horrific. Um, so, so actually our outdoor air ventilation rate uh, two air changes per hour comes from this period, this basically uh, pre turn of the century period. Uh, so the architectural literature of that era talks a lot about space and volume per bed. Uh, it was common to have 100 square foot per bed and then 1,000 to 1,500 cubic foot per bed, 2,000 to 3,000 cubic foot per hour per bed. Of course, if you do the simple math on that, you come down to two air changes per hour. Um, and uh, you'll see that in the writing of the 1880s. And then that is the number that we still use for outside air ventilation in healthcare um, today. Um, I have never hidden my opinion about this. I think it's terrible uh, that as an engineering community, we're repeating a 130 year old number uh, that comes from this era of, of hospitals. Um, that is not what a hospital <laughs> looks like today. Uh, the ward thing went out of fashion after World War II, and, uh, and certainly uh, there is a more modern approach to outside air ventilation. Um, so I think it's really just terrible uh, that we just continue to repeat this two air change per hour, you know, for 130 years without ever questioning or, or redoing it. Um, so from 1920 to 1945 in the U.S., we didn't actually build a lot of hospitals. We had World War One, and we had the Great Depression, and we had World War II. So by the end of World War II, um, we actually had a shortage in hospitals. Uh, to add to that, it actually became popular to go to the hospital to have your babies. 
from 1945 to 1960, we had a lot of babies. <laughs> so we really did have a shortage in hospitals. Congress took this on. Uh, Senator Hill and Burton put together the, the Hill-Burton Act of 1946. And um, that was a federal grant program for hospital construction. And of course, if you're going to use federal government money, then you have to follow government standards. So the, the first general standards uh, for hospital design and construction came out uh, in 1947. And we've really had a federal standard kind of ever since um, of sorts. So in the 1960s, the Hilbert monies came to an end. But our architects and our engineers really liked having a federal standard. So the Public Health Service, the PHS, who had published the standard for the first um, 10 years or so, um, turned the text of that over to the American Institute of Architects. The American Institute of Architects uh, published that for, for a stretch. And then they turned the text over to uh, a new organization, actually spun up a new organization that's called the Facilities Guidelines Institute, or FGI. And so they published the text from the end of the 90s um, up until today. FGI subsequently in 2008 uh, outsourced the ventilation portion of this standard to ASHRAE. And so starting in 2008, um, we get ASHRAE publishing the ventilation tables instead of them being sort of directly published um, within the FGI guidelines. So in the very early versions of that government standard, the, the ventilation requirements were in text form. Uh, and this is a really interesting period. So this is a document written by the PHS in 1966 uh, that includes narration of all of those requirements. And the text was actually nice. Uh, I'm gonna expand upon this later, uh, because in the text form, you could see the intent. Now, most of this had to do with the idea of moving air from clean spaces to dirty spaces, right? Um, so they would tell you that this space is considered to be clean and this space is considered to be dirty or contaminated. Um, the title of the document here is a sepsis, you know, uh, and it's which means to keep uh, areas clean or keeping contaminants out of those clean areas. Um, now, the relationship to ventilation could go either way. We had some spaces that had high ventilation rates because they were considered clean and we want to keep them clean. And then we had some ventilation rates because the space was considered dirty and we wanted to treat it because it's dirty. Um, and I'm, I'm consistently using these air quotes when I say clean and dirty because clean and dirty were not defined. You know, today you can just put a sensor in there and, and measure is this clean or dirty? Is it, is it fifth, five micrograms a cubic meter particulate count or is it 10 micrograms a cubic meter particulate count? That's not what this was. Clean and dirty were more like, hey, we think of this space as clean or we think of this space as dirty, right? There wasn't really any measurement involved and there wasn't any discussion of infectious aerosols uh, back in this era. Um, unfortunately, and I say unfortunately, unfortunately by 1968, we moved all these requirements into a table and they've been entries in tables ever since. Um, and so the next slide here shows some of the changes um, in over the years in the air change rates within those tables. Um, so why do I say that it's unfortunate that we moved it into a table? Well, obviously the table has some benefits. On the plus side, the table is easier to use. It takes up less space, less pages to print the table, obviously. Uh, but on the downside, when all those numbers sit in a table, we lose the intent piece. So we see these numbers, but we very much lose connection to why. Um, we, we don't really say in the table whether the space is considered clean or whether it's considered dirty. Um, we can look at the pressure relationships and try to rationalize it from there. That gives us a hint. Uh, but oftentimes <laughs> that can lead us in, in confusing directions. The classic debate is the one about the patient room in the hallway. Is the patient room considered clean and the hallways considered dirty or is it vice versa where the patient room is considered dirty and the and the, the hallways considered clean. Um, I've heard people argue both, by the way, and the text doesn't say. Um, and then also in table form, we, we really lose touch with the changes that happen. So to look at this slide here, um, why did recovery spaces change from 15 air changes to six air changes in 1978? Um, and the answer is we don't know, and we're never going to know why that happened. That happened in a committee room someplace. Somebody might have taken minutes at the time. Uh, but nobody kept them. And there's nothing in the text that would give us any indication of why that happened. 
Uh, some of these uh, numbers in the table are amazingly resilient to the passage of time. Uh, so this is a slide that I've shown here that, that shows the air change rate in the X-ray space plotted against the actor who played James Bond. We've been through five James Bonds, uh, and the technology in our imaging suites has changed uh, much more than James Bond, but we use the same ventilation rate. I do like to point out that there was one year when we required 10 air changes per hour in this uh, imaging space, and of course there was one film involving George Lazenby, so maybe that's the correlation right there. Um, since a lot of our ventilation rates uh, and, and air change ideas come from the 1960s, I always like to show a couple pictures of hospital rooms in 1960s. Uh, first off, check out those TV sets, man. Those things are cool. <laughs> uh, secondly, on the table, you'll see potted plants. Um, a lot of hospitals today don't allow potted plants really anywhere uh, in the patient wards including flowers. Um, it's been a while now, but ICU, most ICUs, I think, in the United States and Europe don't allow flowers in, in ICUs anymore. Uh, and then, of course, next to the, the pink flowers on that upper picture uh, on the table, you will see an ashtray. And that's not incorrect because in the 1960s, uh, everybody was allowed to smoke in hospitals. The doctor smoked. In the U.S., we didn't ban smoking in hospitals until 1993. Uh, that's been 30 years, but still, um, it's kind of hard to imagine. This is just to say the our hospital environments have changed a lot. They've gone from wards to this to what a patient room is now. And our ventilation standard has not really changed. We've never really had an overhaul or a rethinking of our ventilation standard. Uh, so moving away from hospitals, there's been some other technological developments, what I'll call technological developments uh, in the field of ventilation. A big one to talk about is demand control ventilation. In 1999, ASHRAE really pioneered demand control ventilation, so Standard 62 and Standard 90.1 uh, started to incorporate that. Uh, by 2004, this was a code requirement. I know in California, it was a code requirement in Title 24, and I think 90.1 had also adopted it by that time, so high occupancy spaces or variable occupancy spaces require CO2 sensors and demand control ventilations. You see them in every movie theater and conference room. Um, it's me I mentioned this because in healthcare, we are not allowed to do demand control ventilation because we use the old Florence Nightingale two air change per hour number for outside air, so we just can't do it. Um, and we have some great applications, by the way. Labor and delivery is my favorite example. Demand control ventilation would be a perfect strategy for labor and delivery, but we can't do it uh, because of the sort of antiquated nature of our codes. Um, and then the second big development is the word clean. Because uh, remember, in healthcare, a lot of what we do is motivated by spaces that are clean or dirty, with air quotes around clean or dirty. But in healthcare, clean doesn't really have any kind of definition. Uh, but outside of healthcare, clean does have a definition or many definitions. In 1988, I think, it says 1991 there. In 1991, we got Federal Standard 209. Um, which was the first uh, standard for clean rooms. If you remember the terminology for a class 100,000 clean room or a class 10,000 clean room, that was FS 209. Uh, FS 209 was discontinued in 2001 and it got replaced by ISO 14470 for clean rooms. So under ISO, we talk about like a class uh, five clean room or a class six clean room, a class seven clean room, that type of nomenclature. Um, I, I always point out that for other healthcare standards in the world, um, clean room technology, clean room validation, clean room standards are used for operating rooms. Uh, so since the 90s, now that we know how to do clean rooms, um, you would think that the rooms where we perform surgery on human beings um, should be clean rooms. <laughs> Uh, and that's true. If you're in an operating room in France or Germany or England or Sweden or Russia, uh, than they are. They use clean room validation uh, for operating rooms, but the operating rooms in the United States, we do not do that. Operating rooms in the United States have 20 air changes. Um, I think that the lack of clean room standards in our operating rooms is, is, is wrong. I think it's just it's sort of ethically incorrect. We should be applying the best available control technology um, to the places where we perform surgery on human beings. To me, that's a no-brainer. Um, and just to violate the, um, the non-endorsement policy of an ASHRAE presentation, if you get surgery in a Kaiser operating room uh, built since 2017, it is a clean room. Uh, we validate our operating rooms as class six clean rooms, uh, but we're the only hospital system in the United States that does that. 
So let's also be aware of the development of air quality conversation um, in non-residential buildings over the last generation, right? In the 1980s and 1990s, uh, actually even before that, the 60s and 70s, ASHRAE 62 went through some significant iterations and revisions. Uh, the science behind the ventilation rates and CFM per person got a lot of attention. Um, if you've never read that story, I really highly recommend the, uh, that article, the Klaus article from 1970 ASHRAE Journal, and then the Janssen article from the 1999 ASHRAE Journal. Uh, they, they really tell the story of what went into those numbers and how that number sort of developed over time. Then ASHRAE 62 also went through a major overhaul from about 2002 to 2005, right around the time USGBC started using it as a reference. Um, and that's when we moved to the two variable models, CFM per person plus CFM per square foot. Um, and so there's a great article about that from Stan Key in 2006 that also came out in the ASHRAE Journal. Um, the important thing about this whole progression of ventilation standards in non-residential is that we have these journal articles every 10 years or so. And so they tell us what the science was behind the numbers, or at least what the thinking was behind the numbers, which is to say that in non-residential ventilation, uh, the ventilation rates and the prescriptions are, are fairly transparent. And that's a really stark contrast um, to our situation over in healthcare where our numbers are pretty completely opaque, right? We have a lot of old numbers that we've been using since Sean Connery played James Bond or, or even longer, uh, but we don't have a lot of really good documentation as to what they mean and what the progression of those has been over time. Now, ASHRAE actually recognized this, and in 2017, I think they started the research project. It got published in 2019. Uh, but this is ASHRAE research in conjunction with ASHI and with FGI. It's a major research project to determine the scientific evidence behind the healthcare ventilation standard. They hired a research team and to pull every article we could find as far back as we could find it. And the results were, were very bad. Uh, the authors stated it very nicely in the text, uh, but the overall picture was pretty bad. About 75% of all the prescriptions in our code um, had really no evidence whatsoever to be found. Uh, the air change rates in particular were, were worse than that. 95% of them had no rational basis, no clinical basis, no available evidence whatsoever. Um, and what's more concerning to me, uh, more concerning than the lack of like hard evidence uh, for our ventilation numbers is that they're also not rational. Right? Why would we need four air changes per hour in a patient room and then we need six air changes per hour in an exam room or an imaging room? Or why would we need six air changes per hour in an, in an imaging room if it's in a hospital, but three air changes per hour in an imaging room if it's in an outpatient facility? Um, the numbers are highly irrational. You can't sit there and sort of crank through the logic and come up with the numbers in your head. Uh, they do not make sense and they don't make sense relative to each other. So they don't really add up. So that brings us to this project, which um, the reason I'm doing this presentation was ostensibly to talk about this project. Um, and this was recently featured uh, in an ASHRAE journal. I think it came out in May about this project, which was done uh, in a Kaiser hospital. Uh, the project was done with the California Energy Commission, and we placed 72 sensor banks into a hospital, a working hospital, collected millions of lines of data on air quality, so temperature, humidity, CO2, particles, VOCs, ozone. It's the largest set of indoor air quality data ever assembled um, from a working US hospital. And of course, we varied the air changes. So in fact, we converted the hospital from a pretty high constant volume system to a variable volume system, and we published uh, the data uh, pro, uh, before and after, right? Uh, the results of this are, are maybe a bit shocking or, or sometimes they're shocking to people the first time they see them. Um, if you're like me, then you probably grew up uh, believing that a room with four air changes per hour is going to be cleaner than a room with two air changes per hour. Or a room with uh, six air changes per hour is going to be cleaner than a room with four air changes per hour. A room with 12 air changes per hour should definitely be cleaner than a room with six air changes per hour. <laughs> we even have equations for that. You see those uh, sort of black dotted lines on this slide that predict uh, the theoretical uh, contamination level based on different ventilation rates. But the data that came in in the project 
shows that that traditional thinking is just not really true. Um, so in these charts, by the way, air changes is on the x-axis from, from right to left, and then contamination is on the y-axis that's going from, from top to bottom there. Uh, and the air quality is the same, um, statistically speaking. Uh, having ventilation from two between two air changes uh, all the way up to 12 air changes, there's really just no uh, difference in how clean the air is. So this project actually concluded um, that there is no relationship between air changes and air quality uh, within this range. The other thing that this project showed um, is that there's really no such thing as clean spaces or dirty spaces, <laughs> at least not relative to each other, uh, because every space in a hospital is ventilated with two air changes per hour or more of some pretty highly filtered air. So when you look at the levels uh, in all these different spaces, each color here is a different space type, um, then what you see is that it's all clean. So it's all kind of the same level of cleanliness um, as you move from room to room. So for example, you know, we have a standard that calls for positive pressure uh, in the medication preparation room. By the thinking uh, that we talked about earlier from the 1960s, the med prep room would be considered a clean space and the hallway would be considered a dirty space. And so we'd have positive pressure in the med prep room to keep it from being cross-contaminated uh, by the dirty air in the hallway. Uh, but in reality, the med prep room and the hallway are the same in terms of contamination. And so that pressure requirement is really just a waste of everybody's time and effort. It's not actually doing anything. Um, so obviously this project and the results of this project point to a pretty massive opportunity. Uh, if we wanna maintain safe and really high quality indoor air quality inside of a hospital, we could um, I, I would say put in the sensor banks uh, of CO2 and particulate counts and, and we'd be able to manage air quality to a very clean and safe level with a fraction of the ventilation um, that we use today. So this is kind of where I come into the story personally. By the way, you, you won't see this anywhere else. You won't hear, if you don't hear this from me, you won't hear this. But our healthcare ventilation standard, ASHRAE 170, is uh, a continuous maintenance standard. Any member of the public can submit changes for consideration. You just fill out your name and what you wanna change and the change you wanna make and you submit whatever justification you have uh, and the committee has to consider it and then they respond in writing. They can either accept your change or accept it for future study or they can reject your change. Um, and so I've done this, right? I submitted a change that said, hey, we should really get rid of that two air change per hour uh, thing and move to a CFM per person basis. And the committee rejected that. Um, they didn't want to accept it with changes or, or future study. They just rejected it. So I submitted another one. I said, hey, we should change that uh, two air change per hour thing to more of the standard 62 basis, um, CFM per person, CFM per square foot. So they rejected that. Again, they didn't want to do future study or they, they didn't want to accept it with changes. They rejected it. Um, so I wrote back. I did another one that says, hey, listen, even if you wanted to stick with air changes, two air changes per hour is not the right number. The math is pretty easy here. And so we could figure out what the rationally what the number is for different spaces. We should at least have a rational basis for our outside air prescriptions uh, in these spaces. And they rejected that. Um, they didn't want to do future study or you know they didn't want to accept it with changes they rejected it and i didn't just send in proposals on outside air um, this is just a sample of what i sent in from 2015 to 2019 i sent the ashray 170 committee over a hundred change proposals covering every major aspect of that standard every possible way that i could conceive of of modernizing healthcare ventilation i sent in the change proposals and asked the committee to consider it and the committee rejected all of it I think they actually accepted three. So, so they, they, reject, they rejected 95, 97% <laughs> of the proposals that they got uh, towards modernizing um, healthcare ventilation or opportunities for modernizing healthcare ventilation. And in most cases, they, they said no, not like, no, we're going to look at that later or no, maybe we'll look at that over the course of the next five years. They just said no, right? So the way I would characterize our healthcare ventilation sort of uh, practice at present is as such. First off, healthcare ventilation is different 
and we very much like it that way. The, the folks that run the healthcare ventilation standard are not interested in making it any different than what it is now. We kind of like it that it's not, uh, that it's air changes and that it, it has its little nuances, right? It makes us feel special, I guess. <laughs> uh, but secondly, the ventilation requirements that we have don't have any evidence basis. The ventilation requirements that we have do not have any rational basis. They can't really be sort of explained. And of course, the ventilation requirements that we have actively ignore the energy impact of the ventilation. By the way, that was one of those change proposals. I, I asked the committee, you know, can we add energy in, into this standard as a consideration? And they said, absolutely not. We have not, do not, and will not consider energy when we're writing the ventilation standard. Uh, no way, <laughs> right? And so that's where we sit at present. So then what happened? Well, then we had a pandemic, right? It turned out to be an infectious aerosol, at least in part transmitted by infectious aerosol. So what do we do, right? Is, a, is four air changes in an exam room or six air changes in an exam room enough? Or do we need to add more? Well, we don't know because we don't actually know what that number means. Is six air changes okay in a patient room? I don't know. Nobody knows what six air changes actually means. Um, is two air changes enough outside air? Or do we need more or less or what, what is it? And nobody knows because nobody that number comes from 130 years ago. Nobody actually knows what that number means in a modern context with an infectious aerosol. So what happened during the pandemic? <laughs> this picture is from an ASHRAE journal article, peer reviewed and published very quickly, by the way. It came out in July of 2020. Um, and what I wanna point out to you is that there's a HEPA filter unit in that diagram. And the discharge of the HEPA filter unit goes outdoors. So you have a patient in the room, you have a provider in the room, you have a HEPA filter that is cleaning the air, and then it discharges it to the outside. I just want to make sure that we're clear about this. Fun fact, HEPA filters were invented during the Manhattan Project. They were originally uh, created to filter out beta radiation particles, which are subatomic radiation particles in out of the air, right? So HEPA filters can remove freaking subatomic particles, right? HEPA filtered air is the cleanest air in the world. You can hike to the top of a mountain, your favorite mountain in Switzerland and breathe in the air. This air is so wonderful. That air is crap compared to the air that comes off the HEPA filter. So to take a HEPA filter, put it in this room and then dump it out of a window towards the outside is just categorically dumb. You're taking some incredibly powerful air cleaning technology, and rather than using it to clean air for the nurse <laughs> or for the provider that's in the room, we're dumping it outside. This is a colossal engineering mistake that we made during the pandemic, right? And there's a good reason why we made it. Well, that is the guy who wrote the article. I know why he made it. And that is um, right when the pandemic hit, ASHRAE and ASHI put out some emergency guidelines, and what they said was the old advice. We need to move air from, from clean spaces to dirty. They said, okay, well, in the hallway is clean, and in this space, the, the room that contains this patient is going to be dirty, right? So move air from clean to dirty, get negative pressure. And so that became the cry. Get yourself some negative pressure, get yourself some negative pressure, no matter what get negative pressure. Even if you're going to take 500 CFM of HEPA filter air and dump it out the window, get yourself some negative pressure. Uh, now, in hindsight, we could tell that that's pretty stupid, right? All it took was a risk model. I shouldn't even say hindsight because we were doing risk models during the pandemic. Um, these are some of the risk models that we were doing in the middle of 2020. And the risk models will show you that negative pressure is not a major intervention. Negative pressure uh, is a minor intervention. It creates a small, and I mean a pretty small, risk improvement in the hallway. It doesn't provide any risk improvement uh, inside the room. By contrast, if you want to reduce risk in the room and you have a 300 or 500 CFM HEPA filter unit, then run that filter in the room, discharge the air in the room, clean the air in the room. And that actually has a very good effect for the provider, has a very good effect in the hallway, the net effect of the clean air in the room just sort of blows away any improvement that you could get from negative pressure. Um, and so, but of course, at the time of the pandemic, we didn't really 
have a, a, we had an opaque healthcare ventilation standard. Nobody knew how to do these risk models. Nobody knew how to deal with infectious aerosols directly, and ASHRAE really didn't have any tools. Now ASHRAE does have some tools. So this is where I start my sales pitch for the new standard, which is ASHRAE 241, the control of infectious aerosols. So this got published in 2023 in kind of record time. It took us 116 days from the time the committee was formed to the publication date. If you are in healthcare and you haven't read this standard, then I urge you to do so. Not because everybody is adopting it, I'll talk about that in a second, but because this is a smarter and more understandable approach to infectious aerosols than anything that you've ever seen in your life. Um, so the way that ASHRAE 241 works is that you have infection risk management mode, so I'll call it IRMM. So it's not supposed to be all the time, it's a feature. When you need it, you click over into infection risk management mode. And when you design for infection risk management mode, then each room has an equivalent clean air requirement. So we have those in a table, and there's table 5.1, right? So when you're in risk management mode, you provide this much clean air. But here's the trick. In the new standard, any form of cleaning counts towards that equivalent clean air. So you can do outdoor air. Of course, outdoor air is clean. It's infection free, right? But you can also do filters in your air handling system. You can do filters in a, a single room uh, system. You can do filters in the upper room. You can do filters in the breathing zone. You can do other types of cleaners, uh, other types of disinfectors, um, which is to say that in this model, the model of infectious aerosol control, where we're, we take credit for all of the air cleaning that we're actually doing in the room, this would have prevented us from making that sort of very bonehead decision of dumping HEPA filter air out of a window, right? It's very important. Um, so if you're a healthcare or ventilation engineer, um, I like top five lists. So here's the top five things that healthcare ventilation engineers uh, need to know or will want to know about ASHRAE standard 241. Uh, number one, this is the first standard that directly addresses infectious aerosols. The title of the standard is Control of Infectious Aerosols, and the scope is to establish minimum requirements for control of infectious aerosols to reduce risk of disease transmission. Previously in healthcare, we've always had this implication uh, that standard 170 was infectious aerosols, but it's not. Standard 170, the scope of standard 170 is for environmental controls and accepts there's no uh, direct discussion of infectious aerosols in standard 170. So does that create a little weird paradox? Yeah, it kind of does. Um, should we stop using ASHRAE 170 for infectious aerosols? Well, technically, infectious aerosols are not included in standard 170, so you never really should have been using it uh, for infectious aerosols to begin with. Uh, but this document is directly addressing infectious aerosols. Second thing you want to know is that this is the first set of ventilation standard rates that are based on you know, infectious aerosol risk modeling. Um, if you've been following the clinical literature, uh, you may have seen in, in the last 20 years, there have been a lot of clinical papers on infectious aerosol risk modeling. Uh, in the last three years, there have been a massive flood of papers on infectious aerosol risk modeling. So infectious aerosol risk modeling um, is kind of a booming scientific field right now. This is the first ventilation standard anywhere to use an infectious aerosol risk model in its development. There's no previous work by ASHRAE that has ever done that. There's no previous work by the CDC um, that has ever done this. So this really is a, a massive technological step forward. Next thing you'll want to know is that there's no air change requirements or pressure requirements. The focus on this standard is to provide clean air per infector or per susceptible, it's per person, um, and do that in the room where the action is happening. Um, and so that's what this standard focuses on, making sure there's sufficient clean air in the room to reduce the risk. The fourth thing you wanna know is that there's multiple options. So this standard allows that equivalent clean air to come from multiple sources. That's what I showed you on the slide before. And this is a, that's a major improvement. That allows users to evaluate multiple um, configurations. You can find one that's cost effective. You can find one, a configuration that, that's actually feasible rather than making sort of massive and, 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 and expensive changes to your system. 
Uh, and then finally, the fifth thing that you want to know is that every cleaner that you use for um, equivalent clean air does have to be tested and rated. And, and actually, this standard contains a lot of information on rating and testing of cleaners um, so that each type that you use can be rated and tested. Um, so, so I would highly urge everyone to, to get into this standard. Um, I just talked about it for three slides here, but there are presentations out there uh, where, where people are talking about this standard for the full hour. Changes are definitely coming. This is version one. It was put together in a few months, so the leadership is talking about version two as soon as 2026, I think. Um, I'll also say there's no adoption yet. We, Joint Commission has not looked at this. I don't know that CMS has looked at this or that or that in California that HCI or Oshpod um, has looked at this or read this, so um, it's not adopted yet. But this is a piece of technology that I think everyone um, who's interested in the field is going to want to read. So just to kind of summarize, wh where did we go? This was a long presentation. Um, so to, to, to recap, healthcare ventilation is a little odd, right? Within ASHRAE and within HVAC engineering, we're very different. Right? We like to use air changes. We have our little specific temperature requirements. We have these pressure requirements. And, and of course, we have these very high ventilation rates where we don't care about energy. Um, so we're just very different. And um, what I found is that we're not different because the engineering problems are different. We're different because of our history. And so this presentation, we talked about some of that history. Um, and I, my opinion is that in the present state, um, the, the healthcare ventilation group within ASHRAE sort of likes being different than everybody else and they're not really uh, inclined to be making any changes. <laughs> they like using air changes, they like not giving a crap about energy. Uh, but I do think that, that something is coming in the future. I think 50 years from now, folks will look back at this era and sort of see that, 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 that this is where the rocks came together for some of the changes. Uh, for two big reasons that I can think of. First off, if you're around ASHRAE at all, then you hear about decarbonization and, and building performance, uh, energy performance, and, and even um, indoor air quality monitoring and the rise of sensors in the indoor environment. And, and as those things grow, as those technologies develop, then the healthcare ventilation standard just looks more and more and more antiquated or, or becomes more and more revealed as antiquated. Uh, and then that second big topic is this topic of infectious aerosols. Kind of up until 2020, um, healthcare had a seeming monopoly on the idea of infectious aerosols and what ventilation might be doing around infectious aerosols. That's no longer the case. Um, and so now we actually have a standard um, that deals with infectious aerosols. And so, um, so I think that's going to change things moving into the future.